Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Government of Anguilla press conference. I know I haven't been here for a little bit, and certainly we miss you all. Uh, good to see you. I uh, want to welcome uh, Felicia from Radio Anguilla, uh, Dr. Joyce from the Anguillian, uh, Brenda from the Daily Herald, Mr. Pickering from Channel 4, and also we have with us uh, Deitz, of course, who has been here loyally and consistently. We have with us today the uh, liaison to the Spanish-speaking community. We have a public relations officer, the ministerial assistant in the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Courtney Morton. Welcome back. All right, and uh, we have our ministers, uh, Minister Hayden Hughes uh, for Infrastructure Tourism, Minister Kenneth Hodge for Home Affairs, and with us we have Parliamentary Secretary Quincy Agams marie our Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, Ms. Kathleen Rogers, the Controller for Inland Revenue, Mr. Lonnie Hobson, and it looks like, ah, there is a ministerial assistant, uh, Mr. Merrick Richardson, who was always present, and the controller for customs, Mr. Kiel Connor. Um, you know who I am. So, welcome, and before we move on, I'll ask uh, Minister Hodge to lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, thank you very much, Premier. Normal every day, I get a number of prayers that come to my phone, and this one is particularly apt today. Let us pray. God's goodness is never ending, never failing, and always overflowing. Whatever our struggles are, let's remember that every morning, every day, offers a new day to live a better life. So let's start and end every day with a thankful heart. Remember this time those who are going through grief and suffering, those who are enduring pain and difficulties, especially remember today our um, media colleague, Mr. Lloyd Gums, who is recovering from an accident a few days ago. We pray for his safe and full recovery. Dear Lord, we bring these before your name today. Amen. Amen. So uh, we are here today, it's the uh, 27th of June, 2022. It's my brother Sam, uh, Sam's birthday, so we wish him a happy birthday uh, today. Uh, just saying, uh, Minister uh, Deanne Kentish Rogers, uh, she um, is not here because she'll be representing uh, the Ministry of Education at a uh, conference in St. Martin, and I'm sure by now we all know that uh, former Minister Kyle Hodge um, has resigned. Certainly we want to thank him for his service uh, to this administration, to the people of Anguilla, and I want to assure you that the initiatives that he started uh, will um, continue uh, to be uh, moved forward um, in the best interest of the people of Anguilla. Uh, I'll go over to uh, the uh, Minister of Infrastructure to update us um, on infrastructure and tourism. And um, certainly you can ask any questions you want after him, and then we will continue. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you. It's, it's good to be back. We've been out for some time. Just a quick update on the ministry. Um, the work at the Bloomberg Ferry Terminal is progressing well. Um, the tiling is almost complete it's on the first floor and the plastering on the interior is also on, almost completed. Uh, painting is being done and some of the fixtures are, are being um, installed at this time. Um, as you know, um, recently, I, I don't think we've had a press conference since the unveiling of the, uh, the airport master plan, um, which has, is now in the public domain and can be accessed by www.gov.ai and it's going to govern our our development, our air development over the next 20 years. So we have already 
uh, commence work on that and hopefully in the not too distant future you will see construction beginning over at the um, Clayton J. Lloyd International Airport in terms of a new airport terminal. So those are some of the major things that is coming out of the ministry. Also, as you know, um, recently we had spoken about the Vehicle and Road Traffic Act, Act amendments and those we still are, are working on. We hope um, uh, sometime this month uh, to be able to pass through the Executive Council of Regulations in terms of um, personalized number plates and uh, the taxi cab uh, regulations. So those are the ones that are, are going quicker, but we are still working on the driving under the influence and um, the seatbelt regulations and use of cell phones while driving. So those are quick updates coming out of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Tourism. On the tourism side, I, I know the Parliamentary Secretary can update uh, us on, on that aspect as we move forward. Uh, just, just quickly too, as, as it relates to energy, I forgot to mention this, that we are working on a new energy policy. We want to really um, forge quickly ahead in terms of renewable energy integration and legislation to support the same. So um, that's where we are at the moment. Yes, we just passed a new street light policy and um, that has been approved through the Executive Council and that is important for us as we move forward as well. So we're very happy and excited about that. Um, as you know, American Airlines continue to serve us well. Um, we were recently named one of the top 10 most reliable destinations and that bodes well for Angola as a country. So we are trying to ensure that uh, this rising tide floats all boats. afternoon. Mr. Hughes, could you go a bit more in depth into the streetlight policy? We did not have a, a proper streetlight policy before, and we have a significant amount of applications for streetlights. Significant. And some of the things that we wanted to ascertain and determine was whether or not we were overpaying for streetlights, because we're paying a significant amount to the utility company for streetlights, and how we will go forward in terms of um, deciding where streetlights will go. Uh, like I said, um, we have well over 300 applications for streetlights. So uh, there's a number of things that will be considered uh, safety, um, the area, and what have you as we do all those first initial streetlights and, and move forward. Oh, I forgot to mention as well that we are also going to be installing solar streetlights along the, car the Valley Main Road, um, the newly done Valley Main Road. So we are very excited to see even additional enhancements to that area applications for street light policy these are from persons who wish to have street lights in their district I wish to have street lights on the poles the public poles uh, um, in their particular areas and some of these applications date back years many years some of them are in excess of five years so individuals can apply for a street light Oh yeah, is well, that how it works? That, that's how it really works. You know, someone may be living in an area that is extremely dark, uh, they may, and they, they, there's a pole, and each pole has a number. Well, and you have to have a pole. Yeah, you have to have a pole. I the pole know. has to be in your area. And also, there's another thing that, following um, Hurricane Irma, a number of streetlights were also destroyed, as you know, and most of them have been restored. But invariably, you'll have someone who will make an application to have the streetlight that was destroyed restored, and those are priority. Those are always priority. But new streetlights is something that we have to consider because it has to be a partnership between the Ministry of Infrastructure and Tourism and the Ministry of Finance, because the Ministry of Finance is who really finance um, and who pays the electricity bills. So those streetlights are actually paid for um, from the government of Angola. So these are some of the services that are provided to the people of Angola. Directed, and I nev we never heard anything about it. I is this still a possibility, or what's the? It was erected. It was erected in the vicinity of the um, the Chamber of Commerce, the junction there um, with Radio Angola. Um, that was a pilot project many years ago. This was almost a decade, perhaps over a decade ago. It was 2011, actually. Um, it's still there, as you can see, um, still functioning. But you 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 uh, see a lot more uh, solar lights around Angola. Um, even in private um, um, businesses, if you go to Best Buy, ESA Best Buy West, 
all of the lighting around the, the parking lots of solar lighting. And also solar lighting is also provided by service providers here in Anguilla. So we see a more, uh, a general move towards more renewable energy um, components such as not only solar lights, but solar panels, inverters, and what have you. And the government of Angola, as you know, uh, we are working on a con uh, conditional exemption um, to facilitate uh, solar and renewable energy um, components, whether it be vehicles or whether it be panels, inverters, battery um, backup. But that all has to be part of a general um, solar and renewable energy um, policy and legislative framework. They're not solar. Yes, they are. The new street lights for the valley main they road are solar. solar. Yeah, they all okay. be uh, solar. The lights are already secured. Um, it's just that they need poles to be erected upon, so um, the poles are still outstanding, but the lights are already secured. So for those who are applying for street lights, why not just make them all solar? Well, we have uh, existing lights in stock. Well, not us, but Anglic has existing lights in stock. Unfortunately, uh, they are LED which um, reduces the cost of electricity as well. But um, going forward, that is where we want to go. Honorable Minister, a um, couple of weeks ago when we had the last press conference, we had a sudden power outage. And um, the standby machine here that should have kicked in did not until somebody had to go down to do something to it before. Um, it was activated. We are in the hurricane season. Uh, you are the Minister of Infrastructure. Can you tell us about the emergency vehicles? All government places that has standby, are they service? Are they uh, in place that suppose we have a sudden um, storm coming? Can, you, can we really rely on those things? About um, living in a hurricane zone is that you're always in a state of readiness. You're always prepared. And while it is disaster preparedness falls under the purview of Her Excellency the Governor, um, we are doing everything that we can, not only as a government, but also as private individuals, to ensure that we mitigate any um, inclement weather. Now, the one thing that we know for sure is that once there's um, inclement weather, we can always rely on Elvin's weather updates to ensure that we are prepared. And he served us well during the time of Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, um, and, and the like. And um, we are very um, grateful for his complimentary service to us. So we are always prepared. But apart from that, uh, we have a regular maintenance program for all government vehicles. And that maintenance is definitely done. Um, we have some really capable people in the Ministry of Infrastructure who checks the, um, the number of miles, um, ensure that everything is followed, ensure that these vehicles are, are regularly maintained. So in terms of that, we are always prepared. And um, as you know, um, we have gone through some of the worst hurricanes in, in, in ever, whether it be Hurricane Lewis, Hurricane Lenny, or Hurricane Irma. And we have fared well um, in terms of government assets. We also have a number of backup generators that we can mobilize, that we can move around, if so be the case, if so needed. We also had um, the benefit of a tremendous um, monetary contribution from, from the British government to develop new facilities in Angola that are more resilient and more hurricane proof. So we are better today than we were in 2017 and I have full confidence that the, the teams in the respective departments, um, the de Department of Disaster Management and the Department of Natural Resources is ready if there's any um, e eventuality. The Valley Road is working perfectly People are working there, but um, I still think that um, some seniors still having challenge with um, the signs and the road being painted properly. Um, when or how early would we see um, the, those signs um, rectified? I have noticed that during the night, they are extremely bright. You know, the signs illuminate well. But during the day, it almost blends into the concrete. We have had discussions about that, um, whether or not we may put a perimeter around the, the, the signage that is actually on the road itself. Um, that is something that we have been considering, and that might be a possibility. So those are things that we consider, and we continue to make little tweaks as, as we move forward to ensure that our people are safe. Um, while I say that, we still see persons who are 
not utilizing the runabout in the manner in which they should be. And um, maybe you were right, maybe we do need to have a training course um, to help us to navigate uh, the runabouts. It's good to know that the government um, vehicles and all that stuff will be ready if we do have a hurricane. My big concern is all these buildings that are still look like Hurricane Irma just happened yesterday. And it's such a disaster waiting to happen. Should we have another one that blows all that stuff into somebody else's house and, you know, could not just break and damage the structures, but hurt people on the inside as well. Is there anything we're gonna, how are we gonna try to get persons to do something about their mess, and then if government has any mess, mm -hmm. clean it up? Interesting that you may raise that. Just, just last week, um, meeting with the department, if you, you notice that part of the title of this ministry is H, and the H stands for housing. And I, I asked the question, what does that really mean? You know, <laughs> to be the Ministry of Housing. And it was, explain, it was explained to me what it really means. But you don't have the legislative uh, framework in order to address many of these issues. And we have known, way back in 2006, for example, when the physical planning bill was tabled, and uh, there were huge protests on the island relating to that. And, um, but even apart from the physical planning bill, I think that we can do all we can in terms of addressing that sit those situations. But there are some public buildings that we are addressing. Uh, just on the junction of the George Hill, Jeremiah Gums Highway, on the left-hand side, that building there with the container there, that is, uh, belongs to the public. It's a public asset, and that is something that we are rectifying. We are trying to see how we can allocate funding to have that building removed and also the cottage hospital. The old cottage hospital, it's also a disaster waiting to happen and that is something that we are re addressing as well. And we are also addressing some of the issues that we found at the Island Harbor Pier. So that is something that we are also looking to rectify in a very, 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 very short term. So these are, there's a number of public assets that we have been trying to address at the same time. But it always comes down to allocation of funds. But we can say safely that we have allocated the funds for the repairs at the Island Harbor Pier. And thanks to the Premier for pushing that along. Including derelict vehicles. I know people get attached to their things, but Lord have mercy. Uh, Somebody, I mean, we have to remove some of this. Well, it's crazy. You know, we have always said that derelict vehicles is a scourge. And we believe it is a scourge. And we, we had that discussion just last week again. How can we address the issue of derelict vehicles? And people does have an affinity to the 1969 car that is barely recognizable. But be that as it may, um, we have now a truck um, at, the, at the ministry that we can help you to get rid of your derelict vehicle. And perhaps it is that we may should have policy, so we may sh should have legislation to address the real and present danger of de derelict vehicles. It is a real and present danger. And not only during a hurricane season, but it's attraction for rodents and insects and other dangerous critters. So these are the things that we have to address as a country, you know, and see how we can mitigate and, and try to enhance the product that we are offering as a five-star luxury destination. You see, also spoke about the construction soon to start on the airport, um, on the airport project, and we know the master plan is currently out for public consumption. Could you tell us the procedures for that in the funding aspect relating to this project? And speak to the funding right now. Um, typically, when you speak of funding, that can compromise what the actual um, cost of the tender would be. So we don't need to speak to the funding because obviously the funding is not even coming from internal sources. It's coming from external sources. Um, because we have been fortunate to be able to have the, the funding um, that is not being raised internally. Um, by external sources to assist us in the infrastructure, needed and necessary infrastructure development. But as you can see from the airport master plan, there are three phases. Um, phase one, which begins now to, to year six, and then year seven onwards, and up to year 20. By year 20, we should have it all completed, um, so long as we don't have any real deviations from the existing plan. Of course, there will be some need to deviate. But we shouldn't be able to deviate too far from the existing plan because it, it was done in conjunction with the regulatory bodies and so forth, such as ASA and FA and so forth. But um, right now, 
what is being done is we are preparing um, tender documents for the development of the of the design of the airport terminal itself and the park and all the uh, auxiliary services that is needed in that particular phase. And uh, once that is completed, then there are tender documents that are prepared and, and there's a tender put out for the construction. Once the construction is secured, then you negotiate with the contractor and the contract is consummated and then you can move forward with the construction. So that is uh, the immediate phases for that particular project. External sources, you mean funding from the UK? Or from the United Kingdom. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we have been really tapping on the United Kingdom for the better part of five years. And, and the United Kingdom has been delivering. But, you know, there's always the need for us to pay our own way and to develop a sense of independence. And if we want to be independent in all aspects, we must be able to pay for that independence. Thank you, Minister. And that was a very thorough... Um, update on the Ministry of Infrastructure and uh, Tourism. Um, I'll go now to the, uh, if there are no further questions, I'll go to the Minister for Home Affairs, the Honorable Kenneth Hodge. Uh, thank you very much, Premier. Before I get into what I want to talk about, the Minister mentioned the Physical Planning Bill, and it is our intention to bring that bill back for public consultation either later this year or early next year because we recognize there's a need for it, there's a need for modern planning legislation and so we are planning to bring it back for the public to get an opportunity to review it, to share their thoughts, their concerns, their comments on it so that we can take the process forward. So. I will advise on that basically a bit later down in the year. But I'm really, very, very happy today to make this announcement. Extremely delighted, so to speak. And the announcement is the appointment, the Executive Council has approved the appointment of a minimum wage advisory committee. Part four of the Labor Relations Act 2018 provides for the appointment of a minimum wage advisory committee to investigate the conditions of employment for a trade occupation and to make recommendations for the living, for the fixing of minimum rates of wage. The committee shall include the following members appointed by executive council, and that is part four, section 792 of the Labor Relations Act. A, a chairperson nominated by the minister. B, an equal number of members representing employers and employees, of which one member from each group should be from the hotel and tourism industry. C, one member nominated by the Social Security Board. And D, the commission of labor or her designee, who shall be an ex officio secretary of the minimum wage advisory committee and E, any other person the Executive Council deems fit. The committee may be appointed in respect of more than one occupation or trade, or in respect of all occupations and trades. The Act outlines that in considering a proposed minimum wage, the committee shall have regard to A, the general level of wages, B, the cost of living, C, the general level of competitiveness of the economy with focus placed on the main industries. D, the need to link wage rates with the productivity rates of employees. And E, the protection of employees. So this committee is comprised of 16 persons. And I'm going to read out the various categories of names for you, just for public information. I will preface what I'm going to say as well that the ministry is now contacting all of these persons. They all would have, in the early stages, would have agreed to serve on this committee. So we are now contacting all of them. So I'm going to go through the names. So the chair of the committee will be Dr. Wycliffe Foy, representing the national interest. And the deputy chair will be Ms. Jacqueline Brian Niles representative of the Department of Public Administration. And the other members, Labor Commissioner Ms. Duran Hodge, 
Representative of the Social Security Board, Dr. Magdalene Richardson, Employer Representative from the Hotel and Tourism Industry, Ms. Cheryl Hughes, Employee from the Hotel and Tourism Industry, Ms. Malisha Maku Niles, Employer from the Construction Industry, Mr. Glenville Hodge, Employee from the Construction Industry, Mr. Tash Hodge, Employer Representative from the Financial Services Industry, Mr. Graham Crabtree, Employee from the Financial Intelligence Unit, Ms. Natalia Simlake, Employers generally, Ms. Simone Connor, she was nominated by the Chamber of Commerce. Other private sector employee, Ms. Shanwis Richardson, representative of the Statistics Department, Ms. Laurie Ray Aline Franklin, representative of the Economic Planning Unit in the Ministry of Economic Development, Ms. Rena Mead, representative of the Angola Civil Service Association, Ms. Susan Hodge, and representing the national interest, Mr. Alvin which has been better known as a Jerry Dice. I must say it as well, a number of these persons would have come forward to indicate their interest in serving on this committee, and we are deeply grateful for their assistance. The first meeting of this committee will be on Thursday of this week, so as you can see that we are moving ahead assiduously with the work of this committee. And we are hoping within the first month of meeting, this committee will come up with a work plan that will be presented to Executive Council. So there's a lot of work ahead, and I must say at this point to thank the International Labor Organization. They have played a pivotal role in this exercise. They would have provided a lot of technical advice and documents and resources to help us get to this point, as well as to the hard work of the Ministry of Home Affairs, Dr. Aidan Harrigan, the Labor Department, and all others. This has been almost two years in the making. It has taken us that long to get to this point. And it really took a lot of hard work, and there's even more hard work ahead as we move forward in this process. So I promise to keep media colleagues full updated as we move along with significant milestones in this progress. We will be involving members of the public in this exercise as well through a number of um, town hall meetings in various districts. So all of that is coming up and we want to invite the employers and the employees and other members of the public to come out and share and, 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 and really get involved in this process because it is something that is going to be beneficial to Anguilla to Anguillians and to the economy. Thank you very much. Any questions? Mr. Hodge, during the launch of the Census. I know Dr. Harrigan said the information collected will use to determine yes. the minimum wage um, issue. So it will add to that, yes, because we get an idea of numbers of persons, ages of persons, subsistence levels. Yes, but obviously that is a way down the road, and the committee has a lot of work to do in the interim as well. So we will all feed in, yes, as we go along. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Minister, and thanks for the work putting that committee together. I know that you've been working at it, and persons who had signed on at first, you know, declined at the last minute and stuff. So thanks for getting it to approval. Um, I'll ask the, the Permanent Secretary for Finance, the con two controllers, to come to these chairs up here now, please. And I will talk about the Ministry of Health while they are assembling. Thank you. In terms of the Ministry of Health update, uh, we have uh, 21 positive cases of COVID at this time. And they've been, as we know, nine deaths. And thank God there haven't been any uh, further deaths. We do know that, um, you know, COVID-19 is still present and it's something that we have to take our personal responsibility to make sure that we do the things necessary to reduce the spread. Um, the hygienic measures um, has always been there to help. Certainly getting the vaccine is, is necessary. And 
Um, in terms of travel, we do know that, uh, you know, those, it's easier if you're vaccinated and have the booster to travel. Right now, the United States doesn't require COVID testing if you've been vaccinated to enter. And so that this, I continue to encourage persons uh, to get vaccinated if you're not, to get boosted if you have been vaccinated, and to also get second booster if you're more than 50 years old and have had your first booster more than four months. And certainly those who are 12 to 17, have vaccination still available. And for those five to 11, there's still a um, vaccine that's available um, at this point in time, although that tends to expire much faster uh, because it comes in the already um, unfrozen state. Are you seeing any movement or increase in persons coming forward to take the vaccine, adults and even children, or the numbers remain stagnant? And the numbers have really, um, you know, been stagnant. Uh, persons, I feel, because uh, this Omicron variant, even though it's more infectious, is doesn't have the, you know, severe, um, you know, symptoms leading to the high level of hospitalizations or deaths like the Delta did or even the Alpha variant did. Uh, persons are not as inclined to get vaccinated. However, we still have patients who end up in the hospital, uh, you know, and we, uh, I don't know for sure if um, we still have hospitalized, but up to last week we had at least two persons hospitalized uh, with uh, the COVID. We still have uh, persons who get infected, and it affects your ability to, to function. And even though the symptoms may be mild or moderate with this variant, it still, uh, you know, can knock you down, it can spread. And we worry about multigenerational uh, households where persons can take the disease and it spreads to their older family members and this can cause severe disease and even death. So, so this is still of concern. I recommend that persons get vaccinated and continue to, um, to avoid as much as they can getting um, exposed and getting uh, infected. Brenda, you have a question? Well, there was a situation at the hospital a couple of weeks ago where a lot of the nurses um, had COVID, and so there was a shortage of nurses, and visiting hours were, were reduced to, to once a day. Um, is that situation still the same now? Uh, it's improving, but you still have restricted hours, and we still have persons who are infected, yes, including some of our doctors. Seems as if we're um, heading towards another pandemic or endemic, the monkeypox situation, um, with a, quite a number of cases actually reported even in, in England. Is there any talk about it among our local medical personnel? Certainly, the chief medical officer reports on it uh, weekly to us um, for executive council. Uh, so far, uh, there have been none in Anguilla and certainly in the region. Uh, but we do, um, you know, uh, we are kept updated as to uh, the frequency of it and what is necessary to prevent its transmission. So it is something that we keep forefront of our minds, uh, wanting so that it doesn't get here to Anguilla, certainly. So we are hearing that the CEO of the Health Authority has resigned, is that true? And we're also hearing something about investigation into the use of the medical kits for private use. What can you tell us about this? Um, <clears throat> I certainly have heard that the CEO has resigned. Um, I haven't seen that in writing. Um, from what I'm told, that would be effective um, the end of December of 2022, and uh, certainly I'm, I was away, and so I will uh, look forward to getting a full update, and then we can start the process of, of uh, recruitment. Uh, in terms of the second part of your question, uh, the use of medical kits for private use, I'm not aware of that. Uh, certainly, 
I would uh, look into it. And uh, are you talking specifically about? We are hearing that some of the top management, the, the, the health team, used um, the test kits for their private use in terms of conducting testing for tourists and so forth. Again, um, not something that I'm aware of, and, and I certainly will um, look into it. Thanks. You mentioned earlier in the presentation about Mr. Hodges' resignation. Were you shocked by his resignation? He also, he was very frank in his, in his communication. He mentioned about the issue of a sales tax and you're not, and you not adhering to his request. So I'm just wondering, was this even considered and what are your thoughts about his resignation? Uh, I certainly was shocked uh, by his resignation. Um, he was a valuable member of this team and I think that he contributed significantly. I think that his presence here would have continued to improve the lives of the people of Anguilla. In terms of, a, and I want to thank him for his service and wish him the best going forward. In terms of a sales tax, uh, there was a study done by CARTAC um, back in 2016, which looked at all the different options for, for taxes, and they looked at a sales tax, and they felt that it was regressive, that it would be um, uh, cascading, and that is you'd have tax on top of tax. They um, felt, given the options, considering that, considering how it's done in St. Martin, and uh, they felt that the goods and service tax similar to the VAT uh, would be the best tax um, for Anguilla in terms of its broad-based um, nature, in terms of the predictable revenue. And that was the, uh, what was determined to be the best way to go. And in the medium-term economic and fiscal plan 2016 to 2018, the former government of Anguilla um, adopted that on June 4th of 2018 in the Executive Council. It was approved uh, by the former administration that goods and service tax would be um, the tax that would, uh, the tax reform that would be uh, adopted um, by the government of Anguilla and brought in in the phases of, um, you know, the first phase, the, the interim goods tax, second phase uh, to uh, come up with a rate and um, to uh, switch for the accommodation tax for wholesalers and um, communication tax and then the third phase to include all services. So this was um, adopted then and a uh, request was made to the United Kingdom government for funding to move from the uh, system that they had to a multi-tax system and uh, there was commitment of over $2 million to this. And uh, that is where we're at. So the consideration for sales tax was, um, was brought up as an alternative, uh, given that um, CORTAC and the IMF, which are um, agencies, international and regional, felt that the goods and service tax was the better option. And that is uh, the way we went already, since everything was already in place when we got in to go towards this tax. It is development as it relates to government and the business sector. We know we received the communique from government and we also saw the response from the local sector this morning. We also know that government issued a, in the communique, invited the business sector to a meeting, but in the, but in the letter from the business community, they said they were not attending. Did anyone show up for the meeting? What was the outcome and was any, were any of the recommendations taken on board? So I'll give a little uh, background. We do have the um, Ministry of Finance, IRD, and Customs represented here. Uh, so on the 17th of June, there was a letter from the Anguilla Retail Business Community uh, stating they had concerns about stock on hand before the 1st of July implementation of goods and service tax. And they gave uh, three uh, rec recommendations or three uh, of how it could be dealt with proposals 
for government to look at. We looked at the three options uh, that were given. And I don't know if you're familiar with that letter. It has been uh, circulated. But essentially, of those uh, three recommendations, the, the first one was that they retain the 9% IGT on imports of future stock and add a 5% sales tax. No claim back, no threshold, and then a 13% goods and service tax on services only. And the concern with that is that GST is law. It was passed July 29 of 2021. And therefore, reversing that um, to now going to a sales tax given the implementation date of the 1st of July 2022 was untenable. The second thing is that the policy-based loan with the Caribbean Development Bank is tied to one of the conditions is the implementation of the goods and service tax on the 1st of July 2022. Third thing is that some of the, uh, the $4 million, uh, 4 million pounds uh, resi economic resilience fund that the UK um, has um, committed to um, for this year and with uh, commitment to consider a similar amount for the next two years is tied to the implementation of the goods and service tax. The MOU signed by the former Premier on June 11 of 2022, uh, of 2020, uh, stated this third condition was the advancement of the goods and service tax. Uh, and so given that it would be difficult at this time to now have a full reversal towards the sale tax given that the, uh, the implementation of the goods and service tax date was about two weeks from the time of the letter. The second recommendation was introduce a 13% goods and service tax on services only on July 1, 2022, and then implement the goods tax at a later date pending a fair and amicable agreement between the government of Angola and the retail sector. This too was not um, tenable. It was not possible to do this. We certainly know that the service industries would then be asking for a similar um, you know, delay, um, which uh, would not be possible. And so the third recommendation um, was that as it states here, if neither of the reasonable, practical, and fair recommendations, one and two above, are acceptable, we'll hold to the position that full credit must be given for the 9% IGT on existing stock. And so this is something that we uh, in inform the business community that would be considered. And uh, we would need the inventories as of June 30th, 2022, uh, to know what they had that they paid the IGT on, we would then, this would then need to be verified, and then we wanted an assurance that the savings would be passed on uh, to consumers. Uh, <clears throat> there was a meeting last Friday with the uh, business community. Uh, we had the discussion. We then said that this third option would be the one that could be considered. Uh, executive uh, Council met on Sunday, uh, yesterday, to work out how this would be done. And we sent a letter uh, yesterday evening uh, to the business community, which, as you said, um, they have rejected. We did set up two times today for meetings uh, with the retail uh, business sector, uh, one at 11 a.m. for uh, supermarkets, wholesalers, and distributors. We had uh, three companies were represented today. Uh, I think it was a very amicable discussion. And certainly, I think that those who attended uh, were able to ask questions or get an understanding of how this would work. Uh, we have another meeting at 5 o'clock today with the uh, rest of the retailers and the uh, hardwares the automotive suppliers, manufacturing, and other retailers. So we hope that they will take advantage of that and meet with government and government officials to discuss that. 
But I also, also want to say that there was also, given the concern that there would be increased inflation as of the 1st of July uh, with uh, the implementation of GST, the government uh, put in a cost of living relief package. And this is funded from recurrent revenue. This is not a grant or a gift from the United Kingdom of $1,000 credits given to the electricity company to, uh, for each uh, domestic household, which will run about $6 million EC dollars, $500 EC f uh, food vouchers for those 70 years and older, which, and then a 25% increased benefit for those on public assistance, which will ab be about 115 families. We also, this is in addition to where there was removal of excise tax from gasoline uh, and the reduced custom duty and taxes on food items, which started on the 27th of April and will continue until the end of October in the first instance. So this uh, package runs about um, 13, actually runs um, over 15 million because it's about 13 million for the electricity credits, the food vouchers, and the increase in benefits. But when you add in the, the 2 million um, for the uh, removal of the excise tax and the 400,000 for the reduction in the duties on food items, it'll run about over $15 million in package that, that um, we have basically scraped up given the tight fiscal space that we have to help the people of Anguilla, the consumers, those who will be the ones paying the GST. And so we have reached out to the business community and hope that the relief that uh, we have suggested for the uh, covering the IGT credit for the stock on hand, that that would be given its due consideration. I know I said a lot, hope I didn't confuse you. I understand that GST is tied to the CDB and, and to the loan and so on. But since the passing of the GST legislation, things have changed drastically, not just in Anguilla, but worldwide. Prices have gone up, everything has changed. So in view of that, couldn't some consideration be given to a hold for six months while alternatives were discussed or something? Because these businesses are taking it very seriously, it seems, and threatening to shut down and so on. I mean, all of these things were considered, of course, um, but when is a good time? You know, the the, uh, the goods and service tax, as I said, it's a broad-based tax that helps to give a predictable revenue. We still have to pay for essential services. We have to keep the hospital doors open. We have to pay for teachers. We have to pay for police. We have to pay for fire services. And then these are the social programs, medical treatment overseas, um, those on public assistance. So government only survives with revenue that's collected, taxes, grants, foreign direct investment. And so when is a good time for it? So we have uh, done projecting what can be collected so we have a better idea of um, what revenue there can be. Uh, using the goods and service tax, we can offer the types of uh, relief to consumers that we've done. Otherwise, we're basically going hat in hand and begging the United Kingdom for money again. And certainly at some point, even though that is something that when we need to, we have to, it is something that at some point, we have to be able to make the sacrifice for ourselves so that we can be a more independent, uh, resilient people. And that's the goal. So I'd say you mentioned that three businesses showed up this morning and there's another meeting this afternoon, so. We don't know how many persons will show up. But in terms of um, Wednesday, if there is a shutdown, is there anything that government can do to further appease the businesses uh, to 
come to some resolution to this impasse. I think based on the letter of 17 June, we they get we got three um, options, and we've chosen the one that we feel is possible to do. We've sent that back to them and suggested working with us on that. Um, other than that, I don't know what to say. You know, certainly we've tried to meet them um, where we can with the consumers. We've given uh, you know the. Co uh, cost of living relief to consumers to help get over this um, bump in the road. And certainly, um, you know, the businesses, certainly, if they have other recommendations, we are open. We've always made ourselves available. Absolutely, we know the IRD has done a number of sessions, meeting with the businesses and so forth. And to get a letter now, you know, about these concerns, what they have expressed before, uh, you might have thought was allayed, but now they have flared up. Are you surprised in the turn of events? Well, I wouldn't say surprised, because um, I guess from the in onset, when we were speaking about goods and services tax, um, we've always received some hesitance from some persons. Um, so I guess at this late hour, oh, yes, it may be. Um, the fact that they're trying to kind of turn it into something different than what is proposed, um, that's where the concern comes in. Um, however, we are still you know, moving forward. Um, July is on Friday. First of July is Friday. Um, the goods and service tax will be still administered at that time. Um, we have persons who are registered. Uh, registration is still ongoing for persons who have not registered. And certificates also has been issued to businesses who should be registered to administer the GST and they will be having those um, certificates to be displayed. You all can go into your presentation, yeah. <laughs> Much of a presentation, but it's more so um, just to come out and... Just, um, just in the way of explanation. The Premier addressed the first option that could have been um, from the businesses, and they spoke about a 5% sales tax. However, when you look at that and you evaluated it, it would have been that the consumer would have been paying more. Um, additionally, um, if you look to see how the goods and service tax works, um, it doesn't have to be included in the sales price at the um, businesses because they will be getting it back. But with the sales tax, it will be included and it can be compounded as well. So it will be causing a worse situation as what's being proposed with the goods and service tax. So that is one of the reasons why it was not considered either. Dr. Webster, I realize that tomorrow on the agenda is the amendment to the goods and services bill. And we know the GST is coming on stream on, on Friday. So I'm surprised that there's a first reading. If we had the passage last year, well, this is amendment being made to the bill, only the first reading tomorrow. So I assume you'll go back to the House before the 1st of July for the second and third reading? That is correct. The, and the reason for the amendments is there were um, other concerns raised by different sectors, and um, there was also a letter from concerned citizens. Although some of the, uh, the amendments were already being considered before that letter came, there was something about concern about the penalties, the, um, the power of the um, controller and things like that. So these amendments will address that. Certainly, we are, um, the first reading will be tomorrow and the second and third readings will be on the 30th um, so that this is in place before the 1st of July. With Mr. Hodges' resignation, we assume the parliamentary secretary, will she be the new, will she be the new minister of economic development? Uh, this we will um, decide that hasn't um, been determined as yet.
Okay, there's another issue that comes up on the July 1st. We have the deportation of Ashton Lake. Is there anything you would like to say about this situation? Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Mr. Lake served his time and in, in he's an Anguillian, so we will have to, I don't think we have any choice but to accept him um, to Anguilla. Uh, I don't know the details as yet about his, uh, where he will be staying and these types of things, but certainly I would hope to be uh, updated. I'm not aware of the details of that. Um, certainly, I would think whatever is usual, um, you know, the Royal Anguilla Police Force, um, social services will, will be involved in, in, in that. With the Resignation of uh, Mr. Kyle Hodge from your government. I've been reading from the Facebook things that have been said. And one of the things I think that was said was um, that members of the government was calling him to uh, bring back in the vehicle. Is that um, something that was done? Well, I do know that members of the administration um, didn't call him and ask him to bring back his Jeep. I mean, I specifically, when he came and delivered the letter, um, he told me he was going to get the Jeep washed and turn it in. And I said, what's the rush? You know, and uh, he said he would talk to me, and that was it. I do know that protocol is that uh, the once the deputy governor is aware of that resignation, then the deputy governor informed the permanent secretary that uh, the that the minister had resigned and therefore you know that then re triggers a whole set of circumstances that you know computers keys g uh, vehicles all of that has to be uh, has to be returned i don't know what was the timing of that Dr. Webster, following Mr. Hodge's resignation, we know there's been mounting pressure on some of the candidates, particularly Deanne, to resign. Um, are you fearful of this situation? What do you have to say about this in, if, in fact, if there are more resignations to come? Well, I mean, as I said, um, we have worked as a team from the beginning and certainly expect that we'll continue to do that. Uh, persons will make decisions as they see fit. I think that this team is a good team, has done great work, will continue to good, do good work for the people of Anguilla. That's all I can say right now. The administration has come up on its two-year anniversary. Is there anything being planned? And just more work, you know. That's, uh, that's, that's what we're here for, to work for the people of Anguilla. Let's get to work. Speaking of work, um, I'll just tap in here just to reiterate to the public how the GST itself works. Um, so pretty much there's some information out there, so we just want to kind of clarify. Um, so the GST is ultimately paid by the consumer. However, it is collected by taxable persons on behalf of government on the profit. The profit is pretty much the value that they would add to any um, items that they have at each stage in in the supply chain, whether it's bought in by a person, sell on from a wholesaler to a retailer, etc. Now, I'm just going to give a quick brief, um, as simple as possible, so persons could um, also have a better understanding. Um, because all of us import, whether you do it for your own personal use, or if you are a person who buy to sell onward, um, this will re relate to you. So, pretty much as an importer, I'm just going to take a cost of an item. Uh, let's say it costs $60. $60 is everything including all the customs um, fees and duties that will be 
involved. Now that item, $60, 13% added to that item. That item GST would be $7.80, right? Okay, so the same $60 item that you just brought in, you paid $7.80 um, GST on it, so $67.80. You decide to mark up that $60 item, add some value to it, because you want to sell it onward. So you went ahead, you add $40 to this item. The item is now selling for $100. So with that $100, you will have to add at that point um, GST again. So that's $13 being added on to that $100 item. Now, recall, you just paid at um, customs $7.80 GST. However, the $13 that you would have collect now from your markup on that sale, you will subtract that $7.80 that you would have left with customs. So in turn, taking away 13 from the $7.80, due to government, will be $5.20. So it's not a means of saying, you mark it up, you add on the $13, and then you pay the government waiting for it to come back. You are doing the offsetting yourself. So it's, in that case, there's no waiting on, uh, waiting for government to then refund them. They are doing it at that stage. Okay? So I just wanted to reiterate that because there have some, been some information out there trying to make it seem like you know, it's um, an onerous process, but more like, like I said, they're the ones in control of the whole process, and we are relying on that. Only to, from time to time, we will just have to double check to make sure that you know, the process has been executed in the correct manner. So that's where our checks and our um, revisions will come into play in that whole scheme of things. Now, as I mentioned earlier, registration, we are continuing with it, and registration is ongoing. Um, however, there are some specific um, sectors that do not have to register based upon the $300,000 threshold, um, but they mean they must mandatorily for them to register. And these sectors are the accommodation. So accommodation, once you're a short-term accommodation provider, and short-term, it relates to stays that are 182 days, up to. 182 days. So again, what that is saying is 183 and beyond, so that's persons staying in an apartment complex, they do not pay GST. So they will try to make it seem like persons who are staying, uh, persons who now have, who are landlords, they would now charge their um, tenants GST. So that's not, they cannot, they should not. So again, it's only short term stays. So that's persons coming to Anguilla, you come for carnival, you come to visit your family, you may stay at a rental property, Airbnb, whatever it is. If that stay is less than or up to 182 days, then yes, once that person is registered, that business is registered to administer GST, um, they will charge you GST. However, apartment complexes for persons who are living on island, um, staying in those properties longer term, they're above 183 days, no GST on those days. Um, again, public entertainment. Public entertainment is a new one for us. We'll probably see this coming on board for Carnival. That's coming up. Um, and our shows and ticket prices, we will see um, GST being factored in there as well. And as well as government statutory bodies and auctioneers, those are all in the mandatory sector. So meaning they do not have to meet the $300,000 threshold, so they must register. Now, the registration for GST, again, if persons have to register or feel they are potential registrants, what they must do, they have to submit an application to the IRD. Again, once that application is received, we review it, and once approved, you will receive a certificate of registration or if you have a business with um, other outlets, you'd also receive certified copies of your um, certificate to place in those businesses as well. And also, tax identification number, a TIN. All right? So a tax identification number, which is your TIN, this is assigned and will be assigned to all businesses. Now, the TIN is a unique identifier, and it will also be utilized at customs... Um, for your declarations. So going forward, you, those businesses have to utilize their tax identification number, their TIN, um, in the, for the imports and for the declaration of those goods going forward. 
Um, did you have a question, follow-up question? No, something. You may mention that government statutory bodies are included. So that means um, customers paying their water bill, they will pay GST on this as well? Water Corporation, remember Water Corporation is um, exempt from the GST, right? But some others, um, like for example, ASPA, um, even Health Authority, even though the Health Authority may offer um, exempt, so it's a mixture, they have exempt services, such as the doctor visit. However, they have pharmacies, and they have stores where you purchase items, water, um, over-the-shelf items such as those. So those will be taxable items as well. So we will, get, we will have a list of those as well um, published once we publish a complete list of all GST registered um, businesses. Just for clarity, nothing on government services in terms of um, renewing your license, your driver's license? And so no. no. So the, gov the services that offer that IRD, such as like you mentioned, um, property tax, renewal of driver's license, renewal of vehicle licensing, no. They are, those are not GST um, taxable. I didn't quite catch what you said about pharmacies. Right, so we're saying because um, the health authority um, is a mixture of exempt services and taxable services. So meaning if you go to see a doctor, the doctor service will not be a taxable service. But the health authority, they operate a pharmacy. But if your doctor gives you a prescription, that prescription is not taxable. But, so I'm talking about items that you're able to pick up in the pharmacy Right, to go to the pharmacy to pay out for, so sodas, water, um, over-the-counter medicine, those will be taxable, but not the um, prescribed um, items, yes. Okay? How's that? These um, businesses uh, yeah, will be able to utilize the option of um, claiming back for those, um, the GST that they would incur on importation as well, or any local purchases on those items. All right, so the obligation of a GST registered um, business, so pretty much they charge GST if they're providing taxable goods and services. Also, they must issue proper tax invoices and sales receipts. So you have to get a receipt if, if you're just regular um, Citizens, consumers, they will give you a receipt. However, if it's a um, business to business transaction, a GST registered business purchasing from another GST registered business, the proper mechanism for them, they have to issue them an invoice, right? Because the invoice will also break down the items and this is what they will utilize. Because as, as I mentioned earlier, each business is given a tax identification number. Again, that number will be utilized locally, as well as I mentioned, utilized at customs when they import. So going forward, a GST registered business will provide another GST registered business their information, that tax identification number, so they could put it on the invoice whenever they go to purchase goods from them. And this will allow them as well for the reclaiming of the GST that they will incur on those goods. Again, they have to submit monthly returns to the IRD and before or on the due date, and that's the 20th of each month. So GSC, as I mentioned, is Friday, the July the, um, the 1st. Um, the first filing will take place August the 20th, but however, the 20th falls on a weekend, so it will go on to the 22nd. So once it falls on a weekend, then it's the following Monday from that weekend. And that's when they do all the filings. And again, um, Keeping of proper records, this is something that will have to be done going forward. And again, we, we mentioned that these records must be retained um, for seven years, just to keep those records intact. And again, as mentioned, the persons are now looking um, for government to step in. But again, you have to go back to your records for government to reconcile those things in order to know and understand the current situation. So this is the reason why for the proper keeping of and holding on to records going forward up to the seven years as well. So supplies, there will be a list of taxable supplies and taxable supplies simply means that they are GST chargeable. So in the example of the pharmacy, and I mentioned that they may have a, some taxable supplies, it just simply means that those items will um, be GST chargeable. And we also have a list of zero rated supplies. So zero rated supplies, as the word says zero, 
It simply means that they're taxable, but they're taxable at 0%. And then we have standard rated supplies. And standard rated supplies are also taxable supplies that are charged at the GST amount, 13%. Exempt supplies. And so we also have a list of exempt supplies, and I would have mentioned the medical supplies as one of the examples. Um, this means that no GST is chargeable. Um, registration and input tax credits for those items are not allowed because, again, no GST is chargeable. Now, documents that are required for persons to keep when they're claiming their input tax credit, they have to retain and keep their customs import declarations, um, tax invoices, so that's tax invoices that will be issued locally uh, from business to business, um, tax debit notes, as well as tax credit notes. Now, all filings, filings are done electronically. And they're done on the online portal, that's at IRD. So the portal is found at services, that's the word services, dot gov dot AI. And that's where persons can also um, register. Now, the GST has been tossed around with some bad words in it, but also the GST comes with some good things in it. And those good things are things such as relief. So it comes with relief um, in the GST. And earlier, I would have mentioned to you the zero-rated items. So zero-rated supplies, those are the items that will attract GST at 0%. Hence, again, no GST will be charged on the importation and the sale of these items. So again, the zero-rated items means that there is 0%, meaning no GST is charged on those items on importation and on the sale. So they must not and cannot charge in the GST on these specific items. So there's a few examples of the zero-rated supplies. Um, we have basic food items, such as rice, flour, chicken, locally produced fish, meat, eggs, vegetables, fruits. Um, the complete list will, can be found on the ird.gov.ai website. Um, in the regulations, table four will have a complete um, list. It's, uh, Yes, sir. Um, that, that is website. That is the email. Yes, yes. That. That. The same thing for services at gov.ai. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have an approved list also of inputs um, for fishing farming and the manufacturing sectors. Uh, we have export of goods and services, um, contraceptives and sanitary products, as well as electricity by Anglic to domestic meters up to 130 kilowatt hours per month. Um, this is separately from the $1,000, that um, 502 payments that has been offered by government as a relief at this time. And additional relief, we have exempt supplies, which will not attract GST. Again, these items will have no GST, will be charged on the importation and the sales of these items. Now, some examples of um, supplies are most financial services. Um, now, you would have received a list, um, I think specifically it was NCBA, would have published a list um, see what I said here, uh, most financial services except for those with an explicit fee. So that list that NCBA would have published, those are explicit fees, hence 13% is added on to those um, items. So again, it wouldn't be attracted to loans. Are you going and getting a loan? No GST is added on for you going to get a $150,000 loan. The GST is not added on to that. If there's a processing fee to get that loan, a standard fee, an application fee, then that fee is um, GST chargeable. So not the amount of monies that you're trying to get in a loan. Um, also an exempt, life insurance, health, and international travel insurances, uh, medical devices, services, and prescription 
pharmaceuticals, education services and supplies subject to the approval from the Department of Education. So that simply means that you look into bringing books, um, laptop, computer, perhaps for specific for education purposes. You just have to write to Ministry of Education, get that approval, take it on to customs, and they will render that. Vacant land is exempt from GST. I just want to repeat it one more time. Vacant land is exempt from GST. So it simply means that there's no GST on vacant land. If you decide to pass it on to your family member or sell it, no GST is incurred in that. Um, domestic public transportation and international transportation of passengers and goods. So this means persons traveling back and forth on ferry boats, catching your flights to leave the island, uh, come in, those do not incur GST. Um, however, for the boats, I just want to mention charter. A charter boat is different from ferry. So the charter service, however, will incur, but not the ferry service that's utilized for the boat. Um, GST impact on pricing. And I just want to make this clear again for consumers, the listening public, and those persons who will be going around shopping. Um, the legislation as it stands right now, it states that prices quoted, displayed, and advertised must be inclusive of the GST. That is the law. That is the legislation. However, we receive from um, persons asking to be relieved from this. So specifically, um, there is uh, also an option in there for the controller to utilize the power to allow for the display in another means. So what we've done, we've allowed for um, retailers to not at this time, and they have to register with myself to make me aware of the, the, the intent to utilize the exclusive, right? Meaning the prices that you see on their shelf may not be inclusive of the GST. And also they must have this marked in the store so that you're aware that this is the case. And we will have it listed on our website as well. Um, so that, yes, yeah, so retailers and uh, restaurants um, at this time, it's a, for a period of three months in the first instant, um, they're, they're pricing. Um, so what they may have on their menu, for example, they may just have it stated down to the bottom that 13% GST will be added on to their price. Again, you may walk in some grocery stores, so it all depends on the signage, you have to put it up, um, that will let you know that the GST is exclusive in their pricing. So do not be alarmed by this. Um, again, this is something that we have allowed for them to do, even though the law does state that it must be inclusive. So that's only for that sector of retail, um, hardware, supermarkets, restaurants. Yes, ma'am, look, we have a question. I don't understand with the restaurants. Um, they're paying GST on their food that they're buying. Yes, ma'am. But they're not, in, you say they're not putting GST on the menu. They're putting it at the end. Okay, so. I don't see. Right, well, so what, what, what it is, right now their menu will have their listing price of the item. Um, the way it should be now, it should be the price inclusive of the GST. So if they have a chicken meal selling for ten dollars, it should be ten dollars and thirteen cents, right? Thirteen dollars, sorry, inclusive of the GST. But the restauranters were saying that it's going to cause a little problems, and they, also the supermarkets were changing their pricing. So they wanted to just remain with their prices showing, and then just to state that they will add the GST at checkout. So on your receipt, however, you will see it breaking down on your receipt. So it's not that you won't see them um, explain it to you in that manner. So when you go to pay, you will see the cost of your meal, the GST that you will charge, and if it is a, a, a restaurant that has service charge, service charge also will appear. Right? But the service charge is not inclusive either of the GST. It's only from in the meal price. But what I was getting at was if I'm a restaurant and I'm buying things and the price is higher, Surely then my price on the menu is going to be higher. They, it, they're not actually putting GST as such, but it's going to be higher anyway. 
And we... Uh, and then we pay another 30. Yeah. Now, um, just let me explain. In terms of restaurants, most of the input items would be food items. And if you look at the zero rated, most of the stuff that the restaurants would be using to do the meal, uh, it will be zero rated. So therefore, there is no need for them to even know they would have the 9% in. But after GST, that 9% goes away. So they should be able to reduce their prices, on the other hand. We've had consultations, yes. So, you know, um, we listen. So like, that's why we said we listen, we allow um, the process to take its course for a period of three months, and then we will review and find a way forward from that point and decide which, which option we'll be going with from that point. Now, transitional arrangements, um, the GST, is, when it comes into play, some taxes will be repealed, specifically accommodation tax, um, communication levy, environmental levy, the public entertainment tax, and the interim goods tax. All will be replaced by the goods and services tax. So again, we just wanted to reach out um, specifically to mostly so the consumers to, so that they are more um, armed and educated. Again, we'll be bringing out some further um, guides and information to share as well. Again, any information that you need, visit our website, give us a call, come in and have a talk with anyone in the IRD to get some further information. Um, the GST on Friday, it will be um, enacted and we're looking for a, 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 a smooth and continuous working relationship that we've had with the um, tax uh, public and we're looking to carry this on further and working in a manner that we have always had, which has been one of um, moving and going forward. So we're looking to continue in that vein. Um, so I, I want to thank you for the time. And again, in, in information that you need, contact us by our telephone number, visit our website, and you can reach out to any member of the IRD. And again, thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Controller, for that um, discussion and certainly uh, for um, explaining it so thoroughly. Um, any other questions uh, for any of the panel? The Controller of Customs is here, Controller in Land Revenue, the Permanent Secretary, the Minister of Finance, uh, myself, Minister of Finance. Um, any of the ministers, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to um, answer. If not, I want to thank you for your patience, and certainly uh, it's good to see you again and have you back, and um, certainly we're back to our press conferences, uh, you know, every Monday, if it's not a holiday. And I want to thank uh, Felicia from Radio Anguilla, Dr. Joyce from the Anguillian, Brenda Cardi from... The Daily Herald, Professor Carlton Pickering from Channel 4. I uh, want to thank Deitz, of course, for being here. And uh, reminder, the House of Assembly tomorrow will start at, at, it's supposed to be 2, but I think now it's 2.30. We'll ask for 2.30 because there's uh, another meeting uh, that uh, I'm supposed to attend before that. And uh, thank the ministers for being here, Parliamentary Secretary, Ministerial Assistants. And of course, uh, Radio Anguilla uh, for carrying this uh, live. Thank you, um, you know, for coming out and from your busy practices and work and certainly our liaison to the Spanish speaking community for being here. Uh, thanks again. Have a good one. Be safe. And certainly we miss Lloyd because he was involved in a car accident yesterday and we wish him well as he recovers fully. Uh, thanks again.
Good day. Have you ever wondered why taxation matters? To appreciate Anguilla's journey to GST, we must first understand the importance of taxation. Taxation funds the delivery of essential public services and infrastructure to improve the lives and well-being of the residents of Anguilla. However, taxation is more than a source of revenue. It is a tool used to support national development by promoting equity, strengthening economic growth, and building public trust with transparent and efficiently administered tax systems. To achieve an improved and reliable tax system, the government of Angola took a phased approach for the introduction of a modern tax regime. The main phases are the implementation of an interim goods tax, IGT, on the 1st of October 2019. IGT will be repealed and replaced by GST on 1st July 2022. The passing of a Goods and Services Act on 29 July 2021. The GST registration period for businesses from April 2022 and the implementation of a GSC tax system on 1st July 2022. GSC brings many benefits for businesses and people in Anguilla. For example, people in Anguilla will benefit from modernization of Anguilla's economy, creation of a safety net, more resilience to economic shocks, and higher accountability from government and businesses. Additionally, GSC registered businesses will benefit from the recovery of GSC paid on their purchases, easier maintenance and accounting records through an automated portal, and enhanced marketplace credibility and reputation. The Inland Revenue Department is preparing for the commencement of a GST tax system through launching its website and taxpayers online portal, modernizing and digitizing its services to allow filing and payment online, training its staff and conducting taxpayer education initiatives. What do businesses need to do to prepare? Prior to the GST implementation date, businesses must check whether they are required to be a GST registered business by 1st May 2022, ensure their accounting systems can administer GST, maintain accounting records, prepare point of sales to capture the GST calculation, and revise pricing to display prices inclusive of GST. Consumers, on the other hand, must, from 1st July 2022, be knowledgeable of zero-rated supplies and exemptions, know that only GST-registered taxpayers can charge them GST, familiarize themselves with the GST certificate, and review receipts and invoices. IRD looks forward to engaging with the people and businesses of Anguilla throughout this journey. This is the journey to GST, the journey to growing sustainably together.